Thank you so much. <clears throat> of all things, uh, the day when I'm supposed to be speaking, uh, the Lord has seen fit to basically take my voice. So I, ho I hope I can maintain it. Everybody can understand me? All right? Okay? Good, good. <clears throat> well, this actual topic is... is One. Good? Okay, so the actual topic is the contemporary challenges that we all face in our various institutions, and particularly an understanding for what IOTA is really doing very well, which is bringing the conversation between new world, old world, um, and that's an important thing. Maybe one of the most important things to understand as we try to sort of get the dialogue between old world, new world thinking is even the terminology. Uh, sometimes we're confused about the use of the word seminary. We've used seminary here. Uh, in some places that means like a high school um, theological education. Uh, the use of the term academy. For instance, St. Vladimir Seminary, where I'm the president, <coughs> was founded uh, 80 years ago uh, with the intention of eventually becoming an academy in the Russian tradition. In 1948, that was achieved. But we rarely ever refer to ourselves as an academy because in the American context, that often means like a preschool, Little Lamb's Academy. Um, in our context, seminary is understood, and it's understood particularly as a graduate level school, or as again, in some traditions, they would simply refer to a faculty. Um, we have uh, in North America also two styles of seminaries. One is an embedded seminary. Embedded, that term means that they are associated with a university. <clears throat> and then uh, there are standalone seminaries, as St. Vladimir's happens to be. Uh, that means we're, we're on our own. And I think another point of clarity as we begin this uh, process today is to understand finances. And I'll spend some time on finances. Uh, but in many places are, are, are actually subsidized by the state. And in a, a U.S. Uh, context, uh, we are on our own. Uh, we receive no government funding whatsoever. And sometimes people are shocked at that. Uh, and quite frankly, when we look at the issue of contemporary challenges for theological education, from our context, from where I sit, Certainly, the number one is, in fact, financing. Uh, St. Vladimir's operates with a $4.2 million annual budget. We have four revenue streams uh, for which to do that, but at the same time, we're now dealing with the most indebted generation in North America regarding higher education. So we're actually receiving students that are already coming to us with an enormous amount of financial debt uh, on their backs, and so we work very hard to cover that. Very interestingly enough, I've had some good conversations since I've been here <clears throat> from people literally around the world. They're also speaking about how the normal place where one, as a student, a theology student, would find support is being pulled back. Dioceses, metropolias, all of these things are not financing their students globally in the way that they once did and what the expectations should be, okay? So we're sort of good at that point. Got our terminology down. Okay, great. Well, St. Vladimir's, as I mentioned, is now in its um, 81st year. Uh, we just observed the, the 80th anniversary, and of course, along with that, um, was the 50th anniversary of St. Vladimir's Seminary Press. Uh, when you go outside and look at the books, there's a, there's a large percentage of SVS Press books there. This is an interesting fact about how, as an Orthodox institution, we have a unique niche uh, which allows us to, to make um, uh, our mission possible uh, through publications. Uh, St. Vladimir's was founded in 1938, and the founding documents say that the seminary is intended to be missional in the context where orthodoxy is a distinct minority. And you may or may not be aware of this, but um, orthodoxy in the U.S. context is 1% of the U.S. population. And quite frankly, I think that's being slightly generous. Uh, but that's what we're operating from. So we were intended to be missional. Certainly, I think SVS Press accomplishes that. But there are 280 accredited 
graduate seminaries in the North American context, Canada and the U.S., 280 schools, uh, and we're the only, the only theological seminary with a press that's not subsidized that makes a profit. Now, that's remarkable, but that's a unique piece of, of the conversation today because it also says there's much interest in orthodox publications, and when you also look at the, at the, the number of people who are buying SVS Press books outside of the Orthodox context, uh, it's about 50%. So that's an important part of any kind of theological education. There has to be an outreach beyond the actual institution, okay? So we're good there. <clears throat> we are accredited by what's called the Association of Theological Schools in North America. As I said, there are 280 schools. In December, <clears throat> I attended the pres se um, seminary president seminar in California, and uh, the CEO of our accrediting agency was showing the change in demographics of the makeup of the 280 schools. It used to be dominated by mainline Protestants, no question. But in the last 25 years, mainline Protestant schools have gone down considerably. Evangelical schools have rise to the point that they are the dominant block of institutions, and then there are Roman Catholics. As uh, he was laying this out on the board, someone raised their hand and said, Frank, your math is off, that's only 99%. And he said, I've been trying to find that 1%, and so I raised my hand and said, I'm sitting over here. <laughs> he then said something that was classic. He said, we always forget the Orthodox. So that's important to know, I think, again, as we're looking at some of the contemporary challenges. One of the challenges is people are looking for us and they can't find us. So that's an important thing to lay down here. One of the things that was frightening for me as I listened to the presentations is 50% of the standalone seminaries in a North American context for the last decade have been operating um, on, uh, on an underfunded budget, deficit budgets. That can't go on forever. It's, it's not sustainable. Schools are merging, particularly in the Lutheran traditions, Anglican traditions. They're merging. They're trying to move from being standalone to be an embedded institution with the university. Many of the universities, though, look at their debt and are like, thank you, keep a distance. So the merger of North American seminaries at this point, there's one proposal being put forward once every three to four months at the moment. So it's rapid, all right? So we're good at all of those things. Uh, the other thing that was, that's certainly part of the landscape that we're looking at is the move for online, 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 online. When you look at theological education from an orthodox perspective, that's probably not the best way, certainly, to form a future priest. And so uh, there were a couple of examples given of, of how dominant the move for online is. For instance, many of you probably know Fuller Theological Seminary in California. It's a large, well-known Protestant evangelical school. They have sold their beautiful campus in Pasadena, California. They're relocating and they're going to put the emphasis on, on online. They use the example of Princeton Theological Seminary as a school that's going in the direction that St. Vladimir's is going, which is to actually rethink what it means to be a residential seminary. So that's where I am. You've got this wild-looking orange thing in front of you. That's my handout for you. Um, and I'll be walking you through that. So literally, with about 10 years of listening to our various constituents, we've now launched this year, this is the trial run year for what we're calling Vision 2020, uh, preparing a new generation of church leaders. We're not abandoning the online. Probably in 2020, we will offer a Master of Arts degree. We do offer four degrees, Doctor of Ministry, Master of Arts, Master of Theology, and of course the core, which is Master of Divinity, the normal ordination track degree. We'll, we'll no doubt launch that in 2020, but we've done a great deal with hybrid courses. In fact, our faculty are all learning how to actually teach hybrid courses, for those that don't know. Um, this actually allows us, as a small seminary, to tap top drawer professors uh, who can teach a course that's 49% online, 51% residential by intensive seminars. So, for instance, we tapped uh, Dr. Um, Dan and Jane Hinshaw. I know many of you know them. They work in Romania, Ethiopia. They teach palliative care, 
Um, they're on the faculty of the University of Michigan Medical School. I couldn't have professors like that unless I was able to offer it through hybrid. So that gets blended in. We also think that hybrid courses may be a way for potential theology students to get their feet wet. They could take a hybrid course on their own before actually making the commitment to live in a residential context. So to borrow a phrase from Walt Disney, we are reimagining uh, what it means to be a residential seminary. And we've come up with something that looks very much like a Benedictine model. And those of you that know the rule of St. Benedict and life in, in, of accountability in a Benedictine monastic setting, that's really kind of what we're modeling uh, things on. I think we're reaching a balance between the high standards of academics, which St. Vladimir's is known for, but along with the pastoral, practical side of things, uh, and also not neglecting the spiritual aspect in terms of the formation of candidates who are studying theology and candidates for ordination. That was an important part that just we weren't getting it quite right, but I think we've made the adjustments now to which we seem to be getting a satisfactory balance between those three contexts. In terms of the, of the, um, the Benedictine model, we've done some pretty radical things. Take the MDiv degree, it was 96 credit hours. We've reduced it down to 72. Not that we're dumbing down the program, but we're allowing for more for pastoral formation to evolve out of the academics. So we're now the school, the Orthodox school, that has clinical pastoral education. Uh, that's a nationally recognized uh, way for certification. That's also important in terms of vocations for allowing proper credentials for chaplaincies and the various different degrees. We're doing that. We're also listening to what our people are saying in terms of the way we serve the church. Peter Butenyev is sitting here in the audience. Uh, he's literally been my right-hand man at the seminary in the creation of what we call the Sacred Arts Institute. If you don't know about it, go online. I won't spend much time talking about it here today. But what it's been able to do is actually blend in the arts much more deeply into theological education. I mean, just imagine this. We sort of scratched our heads at one point and thought, goodness, we put someone on ordination track for three years here, and they never touch a course in iconography or iconology and we're orthodox. We have to correct those kinds of things. So a way of blending in the arts, it allows us to bring in not only spectacular programs, which subsidize what we're doing there, but it gives our students a chance to meet some of the most remarkable people in those various fields. We do that now <clears throat> because in the new structure, there are no night classes. One of the reasons there are no night classes is we have a lot of married students one of the things you'll look at, by the way, as I say this, is you'll see the breakdown between married and single. Uh, we're bucking the trend uh, in most North American schools in that you see we now have a lot of um, cradle-born and a lot of single. That's a change. I can tell you why we have a higher percentage of cradle-born now. It's because we have a high percentage of Oriental Orthodox students, and almost all of them come to us as cradle-born. So that's why the figure has shifted from what used to be very high with converts now to back to the figures you see in front of you. But the wives in particular were saying to us, for God's sakes, our family life is in trouble because of the demands that are placed upon our, father, our, our husbands, who are also fathers and husbands. So no night classes. The one night that is reserved is Monday night, and that's a program for the wives. Um, the formation of future Matushki, the Huriet, um, Pretessas, all of that. Um, it's not a light program. It's a, it's a heavy program, and everybody knows don't touch Monday nights, okay? That's reserved for the women. One of the things that we've also done is we've re-looked, uh, we've, we've had a rethink, and we've looked at our founding documents, and so we're putting an emphasis upon three areas. One is a recovery of our missional foundation. I was fascinated with some of the things that I saw that the bishops of the Metropolia, which would eventually become the OCA, were saying in 1938. They said we must have a graduate level theological education because America, North America, will be a highly educated society. Therefore, we need a highly educated, well-grounded, well-versed clergy in order to meet uh, the level of conversation and need in such a society. That was 1938. It was remarkable. 
Uh, but of course, we have to learn how to do that in the context of the 21st century. So along with that, we're putting an emphasis upon a rethink of how we present apologetics. It's not sufficient to present 19th century apologetics in the 21st century. So we're struggling with that. And not just simply from the faculty side of things, but as a community, listening, again, to the large body that we serve, which is the church. There's also one more thing, which, and then I'll, I'll conclude this, which is a, a re-emphasis upon something that St. Vladimir's is quite well known for, which is the liturgical ascetical aspect. St. Vladimir's literally took the lead in English language orthodoxy in terms of music, the recovery of the pre-sanctified liturgy, all of these things. There's been a shift again. Uh, frequent communion, which was something that was you know, a passion uh, for people associated with St. Vladimir's, we're seeing actually a decline. Um, Carrie and I were just talking about how we're out just yesterday, I guess. Um, I see the shift. I'm in different jurisdictions all the time. I'm now seeing a rise in what I call vicarious communion, where the only people coming up to commune are babies held in their grandparents' arms. So we've got a lot of teaching to do, and that's, again, one of the great challenges. So I've taken a lot of time, uh, but I think I've laid some things out, particularly from our particular context. If you've got questions or anything that's coming out of uh, what you see before you, I'll be happy to answer those when we get to the Q&A time.